The gospel message that God sent to this earth through His Son, Jesus Christ, is the most important knowledge there is. And yet it remains undiscovered by science. It hasn't been taught by higher education. And as hard as it might be for you to believe, religion has not revealed the true gospel that Jesus Christ preached. The Philadelphia Church of God presents The Trumpet Daily. Hello everyone and welcome back to The Trumpet Daily. If you look into the Bible for yourself, you will see how the gospel message proclaimed by Jesus Christ was actually suppressed in the first century. It was about 50 AD when Paul wrote to the brethren at Galatia, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul told the brethren in Corinth that there were false apostles who were preaching another gospel about another Jesus completely different from the one revealed in the Bible. Read it for yourself in 2 Corinthians 11. Now think about this for a moment. Jesus Christ himself was crucified for revealing the true gospel. Added to that, all of his apostles, except for one, were also martyred for proclaiming the true gospel. The New Testament is not a story about a few faithful disciples who won over the masses with the good news of the gospel. The faithful few were killed because the masses of mankind rejected the true gospel and turned to another one, as Paul said there in Galatians. And so it is, the whole world has been deceived. That's not what I think. That's what your Bible says. It's in Revelation 12 and verse 9. Now will you please go get your Bible so that you can read and study these verses for yourself, the verses that we'll be covering today on this subject of the gospel that Jesus preached. Now the word gospel means good news. That's the meaning of the word if you look into the Greek. Jesus was a newscaster. Most people don't realize that. But he brought to this earth something new that had never been reported. A new message. Good news, in fact. Why was it good? What was so good about this message that he brought? Notice Mark 1 and verse 1. It says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, this was when the message first went out. Jesus himself preached it. Now, Satan, of course, hates that message and did everything that he could to fight Christ all along the way and to try to suppress the true gospel that Jesus preached. Even today, you see uh, evidence of this just in some of the more modern translations of the Bible. For instance, this very verse, Mark 1 and verse 1, most modern translations translate this, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ. They say about Jesus Christ rather than the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a huge, huge change. A big difference when you talk about the gospel of Christ or what he preached, in other words, and what the modern translations have is a gospel about Jesus. And of course, their concept of Jesus is all wrong. But that is their gospel. Now notice verse 11, it says, And there came a voice from heaven, saying, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit drives him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, it says, tempted of Satan and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him." So here is the titanic battle of the ages where Jesus Christ squared off against Satan the devil. And in this titanic struggle, Jesus Christ resisted against Satan and in fact conquered the devil. And in doing so, he qualified to reestablish God's government on this earth, to set up the kingdom of God on this earth. That's the significance 
of this titanic struggle. Verse 14 says, Now after that John was put in prison, speaking of John the Baptist, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel, or good news, remember, preaching the good news of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent you and believe the gospel. This is the message that he proclaimed. And he said it was right now at hand because he could begin to set up what he needed to set up, the church, to prepare for the establishment of God's kingdom on this earth. That's one of the reasons why he raised up the church of God to prepare that government for when the kingdom would actually be set up and established right here on this earth. This is the message he proclaimed over and again. Luke 4 and verse 43, he says, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. That's why he was sent to this earth, to preach the gospel. I must preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. The time, as I said, was fulfilled because he had now qualified to be king over the earth. Satan, of course, is now ruling this earth. It's this world's God, Satan is, as it says in 2 Corinthians 4. But that's going to change when Jesus Christ returns and removes Satan off the throne of this earth and establishes God's kingdom and establishes God's government headquartered in Jerusalem. Now that is good news. When you think about the world and the condition of this world today, that is the only good news there is. When that transfer of authority and power finally does take place. Now here again, when you think of just how obscured this message is, or confused it is, or much maligned it is in popular denominations today, one modern translation says this regarding verse 14 here in Mark 1, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God, it says. I mean, they got good news right, but they left out a word. They left out the word kingdom. Proclaiming the good news of God. That's quite a watering down of the true gospel, which is the kingdom of God, the establishment of God's kingdom. Let's notice Mar uh, Matthew chapter 4, Matthew 4 and verse 23. And again, I encourage you to pull the Bible down off of your shelf and to look at these verses. Look into the Bible and see what it has to say about the kingdom of God. See what it has to say about Jesus Christ's message. And if all that you have is a modern translation, well, maybe you can reserve some money for a, a King James translation, which is the most accurate there is. It's not a perfect translation by any means, but it's definitely the best one that you can get. And you won't have so many of these, these uh, surreptitious changes that were put in there by translators. Matthew 4 and verse 23, it says, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. I mean, that was his routine, going about and teaching in all the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. You can just look at Matthew 9 and verse 35 later where it says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The same thing. You see it throughout the gospels. Here's what Mr. Armstrong said regarding the work or the ministry of Jesus Christ. This is in Mystery of the Ages. Jesus proclaiming of this amazing future news, combined with his miracles of healing, turning water into wine and others, caused great excitement. Immense crowds followed him and his disciples. He was teaching his disciples to become the future apostles while he preached this message to the public. Now you can begin turning over to John chapter 6 and we'll pick up an account here where there was a huge multitude that followed after Jesus Christ. But look, he brought this good news message that the world hadn't heard to that point. And then it, on top of that, he was performing all of these miracles. And you can see why he did attract so many people, great throngs of people following after him everywhere that he went. Here in John 6, we read of this great multitude, about 5,000 people that followed after Jesus and the crowd became restless and hungry. And Jesus asked his disciples, well, how are we going to feed them? And all that was available there locally was five loaves and two fish. And you've probably heard before what happened. 
in this amazing miracle when Jesus was able to feed all 5,000 to the full with just those five loaves and two fish. Picking it up at the end of the story, verse 14 in John 6, it says, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. I mean, they knew what the prophecies had said. It says, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Now notice this, these people, these Jews, they wanted to make him king. Why would they want to do something such as that? Why would they want to make Jesus Christ a king right then and there? That's what Jesus perceived. That's what they were about to do. Here's what one commentary has to say. The excited people having concluded that Jesus was the prophet of their expectation began to plot how they might seize him and make him king. That is, messianic king. See, they knew what the prophecy said. And so they were prepared to take matters into their own hands and to make him the messianic king right then and there. John chapter 12, a few pages over. John 12 and verse 9. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. Another astonishing miracle. Verse 10, it says, But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death, because that by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. So these Pharisees, these leading Jews of Christ's day, I mean, they were threatened by Christ's ministry. They were threatened by the fact that he was so popular. They were jealous of the popularity of Christ. And so they resisted the work that Jesus proclaimed, the message that he preached. They feared the Romans, for one, because uh, they didn't want to be accused of sedition or disloyalty. They were given these, these petty positions there in the, in the province. Uh, the Romans handed that over to them, and they wanted to keep those positions of authority. And so they saw Jesus as a threat, and they also saw him as a, a competing ministry, so to speak, that was affecting a lot of their followers. Verse 12, it says, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that comes in the name of of the Lord. Here again, you see how the public response to Jesus Christ's ministry was that this was the prophesied king. This is the one that Isaiah and others spoke of. This is the one that we've heard about, that we've been expecting. And the Jewish leadership, as I say, they were expecting this too and feared the fact that he could be king right then and there. And so instead of accepting him, they persecuted him. Of course, they didn't understand that it wasn't, it wasn't time for Jesus to set up the kingdom. He wasn't to become king at his first coming, as he plainly said there to Pilate during the, the trial. This is John 18 and verse 35. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you unto me. What have you done? He didn't want to really be involved in this. But he asked him, what, are, what, are, what have you done? Let's get to the bottom of this, this controversy, this dispute. Verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Now you look into that Greek word there for world, and uh, it's from the Greek word cosmos, and it means a system or an age of man, in other words. 